Hello Internet. Today we're going to talk about Ragnar Lothbrok, the greatest of Danish Vikings. The man was an inspiration to his people. He was considered an absolute terror for Europe, a destroyer of dragons, father of kings, and actually the ancestor of the still reigning modern day royal Danish family. There are plenty of legends about him. There is even a fairly popular television show going about him right now, so I figured we would first take a quick look at the legends and then what little actual historical material we actually have on him. So, enjoy. Most legends agree that Ragnar was the son of Sigurd the Ring, king of Sweden, and through him a kinsman of the famous King Gottfred of Denmark, and thus the son of the cousin of Harek I, the king of Denmark at the time. He became an important Viking sea king and the father of many children. At first he was married to the shield maid Lagertha, who he won by killing her defending bear and boar in her house. But a few years later he heard about Thora, the daughter of another Swedish monarch. Uh, she was so beautiful that her father had placed her inside a mansion and placed a dragon outside to make sure that no one actually got in to despoil his precious daughter. The dragon had grown so big that it could wrap itself around the entire house in which Thora was living, and its breath had become so poisonous that no man could resist it. Not even her own father could get in to her, but Ragnar find, found a way. He took a suit of skin and covered it it in pitch and oils, then froze it in the wintry water until it became hard as iron, and went up to the dragon. It breathed fire at him, but the suit prevented him from being poisoned by its breath, and Ragnar eventually managed to kill the dragon, and through that became the husband of the most beautiful woman in the Nordic world at the time. Because his suit had been made from the uncured skin and then frozen and oiled and pitched, he became known as Lothbrok, the precisely hairy pants. With Thora, he had the most famous of his sons, Sigurd Worm in the Eye, Witzerk, Bjorn Ironside and Ivar the Boneless, all great Viking heroes in their own rights. Ragnar quickly became the foremost Viking of his age. He traveled through the Russian river system to Constantinople. He plundered and traded both in the east in Russia and in the west in the British Isles and France. At this point, he was becoming the terror of Europe, and through his great skills indeed, he was becoming a rival to King Harek, who was seen as a weak, peace-loving king who kept at home in Denmark instead of manly going out to raid, plunder his neighbors, and create fear in the hearts of the Franks. Sadly, after years of marriage, Thora died in childbirth. Raising himself from his sadness and depression, Ragnar went on to his most audacious deed. Gathering the greatest fleet he could muster, he sailed up the Seine in France, plundering, pillaging, and burning all the way until he reached and besieged Paris in 845. Emperor Charles the Bald of the Franks decided to attempt to save the city and marched his army towards the Vikings, but made the mistake of dividing it between the two sides of the river where the Vikings was encamped on an island. Ragnar then took his army and made landfall on the side where the emperor was not, destroyed, defeated, and scattered the army on that side of the river, mocked the emperor for his feebleness, and continued up the river to besiege Paris and attempt to plunder and destroy the city. It took for most of the rest of the year, and eventually to save the city, Charles the Bald paid him a large sum of silver to sail home again. As you can imagine, to that degree destroying the power and majesty of the Emperor of the Franks and gaining such booty as he has achieved, placed Ragnar in the very highest echelons of any Viking leader at any time. He was, again according to the legends naturally, at this time the single most powerful man in Europe. 
It was on the way home from Paris that Ragnar met his third and in some ways most important wife. He and his ship had put ashore to gather some supplies by buying it from the local peasantry, and some of his men went to a poor peasant hut and found an incredibly beautiful woman who asked them to bring her along because they were she only had step parents and she didn't love them. Ragnar, of course, decided that just because she had a pretty face didn't mean that he was in any way obliged to her, so he put her to a test. She was the next day to come before him, dressed but wearing no clothing, starving yet eating, and alone but with a companion. She managed this by wrapping herself in a fishing net, chewing on an onion, and bringing with her a dog. Ragnar immediately saw her beauty and her mind and decided to marry her there and then. The dog then bit Ragnar when he attempted to kiss her and it was killed. Sad story. Arriving home to the greatest of acclamation after the siege of Paris, Ragnar was, however, now disparaged for marrying a woman of such low birth, but Kraka, as her name was, decreed that she was, in fact, Aslaug, the daughter of Sigurd Fafnir's bane and the Valkyrie Brunhilde, who had somehow been carried around in a playing case for 400 years to keep her safe from the enemies of her father until such a time as she could find the proper man to marry and sire children with. With Aslaug, Ragnar sired even more sons, among which the incredibly famous Ivar the Boneless. Now, if you notice, I already mentioned him as one of Thora's son. I would like to remind you that we are still going about the legends, and they are not all of them completely logically, internally consistent. After many years of peaceful living with his family, Ragnar heard that in the English Northumbrian kingdom, the peasantry had deposed of their noble king and in his place put the unworthy peasant king Ella. He decided to immediately rectify this mistake and set out with his men in two ships to invade Britain to gain back the honor of the Northumbrian kings. With him, he brought the mail shirt that Aslaug had made for him that made him immune to any weapons. Unfortunately, the two ships he brought with the men he had on him was not enough. His men were slaughtered and he himself trapped between shields and bound and taken prisoner when they could not slay him. Taking off his mail shirt, he was thrown into a pit of vipers because he would not tell Ella who he was. As the vipers bit into him, filling him with their venom and he felt his strength waning, he finally broke out the famous poem. Oh, how the piglets would squeal if they knew what had happened to the old boar. At this point, Ella realized that who he had was Ragnar and immediately had him up from the pit. Unfortunately, it was too late, and the greatest Viking who ever lived was dead. Naturally, Ragnar's son could not let this happen without taking a filial revenge, so they brought their army in a massive fleet to the coast of England, but could not find any decent place to land without Ella's troops contesting the landing site and were at first beaten back. Then Ivar, cleverer than many of his brothers, went to Ella and said that he would, of course, need some sort of blood money for his father's death, and all he requested was the right to have land no bigger than what he could cover with an ox skin. Ella thought this a reasonable suggestion, and in fact was relieved that no more was requested, granted his wish, and Ivar cut the ox skin into a very thin string, spread it as wide as he could, and on that huge area he had thus granted himself, he founded the city of London. Once more, I would like to remind you that you need to ignore the fact that London has in fact been a town since at least the Roman era. Only now, however, did the full scope of Ivar's cunning appear, because with London, his brothers could sail up the Thames and land in his domain, and now the great heathen army ravaged England for years, destroying all enemies before them, capturing Ella 
and putting him to the greatest punishment available, the blood eagle, where you cut someone up from throat to navel and twist their ribs behind their back until they look like, well, the bloody wings of an eagle. Dying thus in pain, the great heathen army had avenged Ragnar, the greatest of their leaders, and at the same time gained huge booty, land, and power in the British Isles. After the death of Ragnar, his sons, of course, came into their own. Ivar, his cleverness being acknowledged by all, became a great magnate in Britain and later conquered and became supreme king of Ireland. Bjorn the Ironside plundered as far as field as the Mediterranean and Sigurd, snake in the eyes, was eventually, after the death of the old and feeble King Harik, elected as king of Denmark and founded the royal line that still to this day, 1100 years later, rules the old Danish territories. Well, so much for the legend. Now for the actual history. How much do we actually know about Ragnar Lothbrok? Well, practically nothing. There certainly was a Viking leader by the name of Ragnar, who was the leader of the Siege of Paris in 845 and was bribed by Charles the Bald to sail off again. There have been several other Vikings but that name, but which one of them is the right one? Nobody knows. Was he a composite character? Did he even exist? There is no real evidence either way. I do, however, believe he was real, but that his deeds were mixed with and stolen from several others. I just believe that there's too much material from the time just after his death referring to him either directly or through his sons for him to have been completely fictitious. The historical Ragnar was probably a Viking leader who was active in the Great Viking Raid on the Franks during the 1830s and then probably leveraged his connections to the Swedish and Danish courts to, say, go solo in the early 1840s, which would then, of course, have then made him the leading figure of the Siege of Paris. He could then well have done a trip to Constantinople, which many Vikings did after all, and... After that, he would probably have settled as a noble in the Danish court where he died. There is a Frankish diplomat's diary or letters home to the Frankish court. He was an envoy to the King of Denmark that mentions that the Ragnar who plundered Paris then came home to a massive feast and during that feast over eight had a heart attack and died. If this can be taken literally, we actually have eyewitnesses to the death and existence of Ragnar. His death that early might seem a bit too early in the timeline, honestly, but the concept of all his marriages, which basically all share similar elements and certain, shall we say, supernatural elements, would basically prove to me that Either some of them has been conflated with mythological events or some of them has been conflated with each other. So it is very possible that at this time Ragnar could both have been had his children grown enough to be at that age and then later Vikings had been named after him for his great siege of Paris, which would then has their actions been conflated with the great Lothbrok. Of course, some of his sons might not actually be his sons, but either the sons of other Ragnars or just connected to him by later tradition. He almost certainly, at least, didn't die in a snake pit in Britain, though Ivar the Boneless was, in fact, a Viking leader who was raiding southern and northern Britain and was involved with both the great heathen army and the destruction of the peasant king Ella in the 860s also needs to be told that while his reputation in the sagas and the legends was as a weak old and feeble king Harik of Denmark was most certainly not a weak peace loving man he was one of the sons of the one of the most powerful of the historically attested viking kings Gottfried and he was the last survivor of the civil wars that wrecked the kingdom after Gottfried's death and by this time he would have ruled for well nearly 40 years on his own and in 845 which would have been in Harik's old age at the same time at the siege of Paris 
He brought the royal fleet of nearly 600 Viking ships, which would mean somewhere between 10 and 15,000 men to northern Germany and utterly destroyed the archbishoprics of Bremen and Hamburg, plundering the entire northern German area, which could very well have been the reason why Charles the Bald was having to pay off the leaders of the siege of Paris simply so he could, could go back and defend his northern borders. A second question is, if Ragnar existed, was he actually of royal birth? Yes, again, I would suppose he was, probably even of the Danish royal kin, since his son Sigurd definitely became king of Denmark, and Sigurd's either great-grandchildren or, even one generation later, Gorm the Old and Harold Bluetooth managed to establish a dynasty without any real resistance from the local noblemen of Denmark after they had thrown out a couple of invading kings from Sweden, thus showing that not only did they have power, but probably also some right of blood for things to have gone as easily as they seem to have gone when the current royal house was established. That time, however, could also very, very well have been the time where the embellishment of Ragnar truly started in order to shore up the new d dynasty's position in Denmark, or perhaps even more a generation later when Harold's son Sven conquered England and his son Canute the Great became the ruler of the huge North Sea Empire. It is at least very likely that it was at this time that Ragnar was connected to the great heathen army, Ella and the whole Viper uh, pit thing. Another indication that Ragnar might be a historical character is the fact that apart from his various uh, wives and weddings, there are almost no supernatural or divine occurrences that refer to him. Most of his legends are, in fact, completely normal completely mundane except of course for the embellishment and the fact that one man probably simply wouldn't have been able to do all the things that the legends tell but leaving aside his wives he was in the legends simply the absolute paragon of how a viking would see how a great leader should be regarding his sons Ivar, known as the Boneless, was in fact a leader of the great heathen army that killed King Ella of Northumbria. Sigurd, as mentioned, did become king of Denmark and was a great Viking leader. And Bjorn the Ironside was, in all probability, a leader of the great raid into the Mediterranean that ended with the utter destruction and plundering of Luna in Italy. Of course, not all of these people are necessarily sons of Ragnar Lothbrok, or if they are sons of Ragnar, not the Ragnar we're talking about. But overall, I would say that on balance, I do believe that Ragnar was probably a historical figure of some importance during his time, importance great enough at least to allow his offspring to go on to use his fame in order to for themselves to become great rulers and magnets of their day. Nothing, of course, can be said with certainty, but I do believe that is the truth of the matter. Well, I hope you have found this interesting. At least I did. <laughs> While nothing really true can be said about Ragnar historically, I believe he is a very interesting character because... In the height of the Viking era and towards the end of the same period and culture, he was sort of the absolute paragon of how a Viking would have assumed their great leader should be. He was sort of read about Ragnar and you will, to a certain degree at least, understand the Nordic Viking culture as it was presented by the Vikings themselves. Um, the stories themselves, of course, can be found in the Icelandic sagas and in Saxo Grammaticus's Gesta Danorum, and I actually say you should try to read them, even if none of them are true, or if they are true, they are embellished, they are very interesting stories that is certainly worth a read for anyone who has any kind of interest in Viking culture. Well... Next time, when we return to interesting history, we are going back in time to the early migration periods and the final sack of Rome and the end of the Western Roman Empire. Until then, I have been the Sage, and I wish you all a very happy day.